Thank you for your patience and good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Marietje Schaak. I'm a member of the European Parliament from the uh, Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. And it's a real pleasure to be a part of this Committee to Protect Journalists event with a special report on press freedom in Iran. It is a topic, press freedom in Iran and human rights in Iran, that uh, is very close to my heart, is very high on my list of priorities. But unfortunately, uh, and increasingly, the um, attention in Europe for the suffering of the people in the Islamic Republic, uh, human rights, as well as Iran's role in the region, is again overshadowed by um, discussions about Iran's nuclear program, the so-called uh, JCPOA, or the nuclear deal, that the American government, uh, under the leadership of President Trump, has just decided to pull out of. And to some ways, it feels like a bit of a back to the future experience, because for the longest time, when the nuclear deal was still under negotiation, uh, it was an excuse by many not to address other very important topics, such as human rights or Iran's role in the region. And I'm afraid that that is exactly the impact that the withdrawal of the US is having now. It makes European leaders double down on trying to uh, keep Iran to its commitments and the verifications of its nuclear program, something that's very important. But I believe it is misguided to only have attention for one single topic, and certainly when that goes at the expense of uh, focusing on the plight of the people, uh, the very essence such as press freedom in Iran, which I believe should always top the European agenda. And so, uh, as we are very much aware of the ongoing political discussions uh, uh, elsewhere in this town, I think it is a very good moment to now uh, take the opportunity again with the work of the Committee to Protect Journalists to look at their research and compare that to the promises of the Rouhani government when it came to improving uh, the, the uh, civil rights or civil liberties situation in the country with his uh, promised civil charter and generally to look at uh, what is the state of press freedom, online freedoms, and what are the consequences for people in Iran. And if it's possible, I would also be very happy to look at what the expectations are from the European Union, what it is we can do, uh, what it is we can take on board on our agenda, because here in this parliament we have tried uh, over the years to keep addressing these very important human rights issues when human rights defenders were imprisoned, um, when people's rights were restricted in other ways, I think this House has been an ally of the Iranian people and I plan to keep it that way. So I'm very happy to uh, introduce two excellent speakers. They will give a short introduction and then there will be plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, as you've probably noticed, this meeting is web streamed. Uh, so that means that we are not just here in the European Parliament following this session, but also uh, anywhere in the world. And I'm very happy with this openness and this connectivity. So we can also expect questions to be asked online. And I would like to invite viewers to uh, proactively seek us out and ask their questions from a distance as well. Uh, if you're interested. But now, now let me uh, introduce first uh, Sharif Mansour. He's the Committee to Protect Journalists Middle East and North Africa Program Coordinator. He's an Egyptian-American democracy and human rights activist who has written several articles as well as conducted studies on civil society and the role of new media uh, and civil society in achieving democracy. He's been recognized as one of the top foreign policy professionals by the diplomatic career. Courier, I should say. Uh, and then next we'll hear from Massa Alimardani, Ali Mardani, uh, who is an internet researcher who has been working on freedom of expression and digital rights in Iran for many, many years. She is leading Article 19's digital rights projects on Iran and is pursuing her PhD at the Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford, where she also looks at communication technologies um, and their impact on Iranian politics. So I can hardly think of better experts to share their work and their thoughts to kick us off on what I hope will be uh, an interesting but also agenda-setting discussion. So please, Mansoor, go ahead. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, uh, 
Maria Chesaki and her colleagues for organizing this meeting and hosting us today. I think it's important timing when we have a lot of attention on the Iranian government about their commitments, about their intention to discuss press freedom uh, for several reasons. One, we want to set the record straight and uh, conduct a fair assessment of what the Rouhani uh, government have promised, pledged to do in their first and in their second uh, term for election. Um, when we did a special report at CPG uh, in 2013, last time we did a report like this, it was at the end of Ahmadinejad's era. And this was an era that witnessed the most dramatic deterioration in press freedom in Iran and maybe in the region that had Iran one of the worst jailers of journalists. And at the height of it, there were 52 journalists behind bars in 2010, after the contested 2009 election. At the time, our biggest finding was it does matter who is president in Iran in terms of press freedom and in terms of the number of journalists behind bars. And the findings itself was based on our survey every year of number of journalists behind bars. And if you see one of the uh, infographics we include in the report, which is available here if anyone wants a copy. We talk about in context. We're trying this time to go beyond the numbers and see, first of all, are the numbers going down that, that there is a moderate president in Iran for the past um, five years or so, and they are. But the numbers is not just about who's behind bars, it's also out of the five journalists that used to be 52, the constant, constant, uh, constant use of um, uh, threatening measure to uh, uh, detain journalists on the, uh, a revolving door policy and putting them in the poorest conditions is still consistent today. And some of the censorship practices, including online, still one of the major threats today. But we also wanted to assess the opportunities and the changes that happens inside Iran. And that's why you would see, for example, an analysis of important junctures that showed the changes of the number, but also changes in the internet environment, the airwaves and the uh, satellite reception. Under uh, President Rouhani, he pledged to open up Iran to the outside world, and this is one of the main reasons uh, he was re-elected. These promises to keep Iran open uh, online and to connect it to the international community and the European uh, countries specifically. And to know that there are more than 80 million smartphone users right now in Iran, more than 40 million Telegram users and more than 13 million BBC Persian uh, viewers inside Iran is an important thing to note when we're discussing uh, any bilateral relationship with the country or multilateral relationship with the country, uh, discussing the market opportunities, discussing uh, the potential for uh, threats with these upcoming openings. And this is one of the things we tried to highlight that with these openings comes opportunities for reforms and threats, new threats against journalists that materialize in online threats, that materialize in surveillance, and that materialize also in uh, restrictions on specific sensitive issues. And we highlight those issues uh, while there are opportunities for reporting that open up, including, for example, reporting on uh, the damages that uh, satellite, jam uh, satellite jamming um, uh, causes in terms of health, uh, the government response to national disasters, including um, uh, earthquakes and others. All these areas of potential coverage can only happen or could only have happened because people have access to internet, have access to social media, and they can share information, make it viral, and provide a layer of protection for themselves as journalists about covering those important issues. And I think we, we see a lot of potential for um, a win-win situation. And this is the other thing I wanted to highlight for 
everyone today the power structure of Iran. And this is connected to the most important discussion we want to have about the recommendations. What can we do about this? We put the record on with fair assessment of what's good, including internet coverage, including access to uh, um, satellite stations, uh, but also what's bad, including uh, continuous use of censorship and continuous threats against journalists, including online. And I would want, like Massa to continue talking about this part, specifically the Telegram part of it, which for many people inside Iran, it is the Internet. I would just focus on how this power in Iran uh, relates to the discussion about policy and commitments and the benefits of Iran's uh, want from the international community, including with the nuclear deal, the market trade investment, and other um, relations with Europe and the international community. We show here what the power structure is and also who responds to who, who's responsible uh, of what concerning press freedom and treatment of journalists. And this lays out the limitations that Rouhani himself expressed publicly about his ability to deliver on some of the promises that he made, but it also uh, it shows that he can still, with the limited power he has, um, push uh, a bold legislative agenda now that his allies have taken over the parliament, broke the monopoly of conservative after 10 years, um, starting with Ahmadinejad. And some of the recommendations here has to do with things that he can publicly do to challenge the system of censorship and to change the laws that uh, brought journalists uh, community outside of the country in exile and brought threats against their families, including BBC Persian and others who still to this day face harassment just because they are dual citizens, they are playing a role in bridging the information gap between Iranian people and the international community. And this is what I want to end with, what can we do about it? And I think for the recommendation part for Iranian government, I think the Rouhani administration can commit itself to fulfilling a lot of the promises they've done, but also in pushing to the public discussion important issues about censorship, bringing people to speak up their mind so that no one is speaking on their behalf. Everyone now in the policy discussions wants and says they want to fulfill what the Iranian people want, but I think what everyone could agree on is that giving them the opportunity to speak up uh, without fear, without reprisal, would be uh, the best way to tell about what they want. Uh, for that to happen, uh, allowing civil society, allowing media voices to be part of the discussion, their concerns, their th uh, threats, the opportunities they have to be part of conversation with Iranian officials, whether it's uh, happening in Brussels, in Geneva, in UN conventions, or on the ground in Iran in visits by various policy officials, including European officials, to Iran. Uh, those recommendations is tempered a lot to just focus on the top issues, and many of it has to do with the need and the threats, but also with opportunities. And I see with the internet angle of it, a chance for a win-win. Even the Trump administration would agree that allowing uh, strong encryptions, allowing unfiltered internet, uh, and allowing tech companies uh, to trade without fear of over uh, um, implementation of sanctions on their products that could help Iranians communicate safely and debate international issues and be part of whatever arrangements is being done on their behalf in Tehran or in Brussels or in the U.S. Uh, this is what I'm going to end up with and I'll leave chance later for recommendation. Uh, thank you again for hosting us. Um, Thank you to uh, Mariche and CPJ for having me here to talk about, um, I hope, can yes. everyone hear me? Um, I'm, I'm grateful to be here and um, I have to thank uh, Sharif and Hanif who can't be with us today for writing this report that's uh, done a 
great job of giving an overview of uh, press freedoms in Iran, but in particularly what's going on with the internet. And um, since the beginning of the 2000s, the issue of internet rights, I think, has become central. Um, one quote that often goes around is that digital rights are human rights, and I think uh, this couldn't be truer in Iran, as um, we know the internet has emboldened many Iranians to do things where um, protesters and activists might not feel emboldened to uh, gather in public spaces. Uh, expressions online is much more um, easier and more common in Iran. And so um, there's two points that I really want to point out in, in addressing what's going on in terms of controls online, which is looking at the overall structure of internet governance in Iran and the problems that exist there and looking at what this administration that was elected on a platform of greater freedoms and promises of open access to the internet has done in terms of uh, progress as well as um, setbacks. So um, the overall internet infrastructure in Iran uh, has become increasingly centralized since 2009. There was a, a protest movement, as I'm sure a lot of you who uh, are knowledgeable about Iranian uh, affairs know there was a protest movement in 2009 called the Green Movement, which contested the re-election of the populist president, Ahmadinejad. And during this period, uh, authorities became really aware of the potentials for mobilization online. And even before the elections took place and the protests started, Facebook and Twitter were censored. And um, there was brief moments of internet shutdowns during the protests, and soon after the protest movement subsided, we saw the institutionalization of a lot of controls online. So by 2010, we saw the ratification of the computer crimes laws in Iran, which set in place a lot of the mechanisms by which we, Iran attempts to at least control what's going on online. And so uh, this law in 2010 set into place the filtering committee, which convenes every few weeks to look at what needs to be censored online. Um, in two, after 2009, we also saw things like the Telecommunications Company of Iran, which is responsible for controlling the internet exchange points, um, and uh, as well as all of the data that goes through internet uh, across internet traffic in Iran. We saw it be, try to become privatized and the Revolutionary Guards, which are a entity or a paramilitary body within Iran, um, they ended up uh, buying up 50% of the shares of this crucial um, institution within Iran that controls so much of what's going on. Um, we also have uh, the problems of these laws inside of Iran, which um, I think it, sh it should be the responsibility of the Rouhani administration to push through, um, through parliament and through various mechanisms for ratifications. Um, we have problematic elements, um, and sometimes it's really hard to implement, which are things like Article 10 of this law, which says that encryption is illegal. And so through a lot of the work that um, I and a lot of others do working to do security trainings with activists within the diaspora and within Iran, you find this creating new threat models where you want to create secure ways for um, different at-risk users on the internet to communicate, but then you have the problems of uh, teaching people to use PGP or encrypted email and putting them at risk of being penalized for doing this. And you know, you have platforms like Signal that have also been censored within Iran, targeted particularly for the way it has been publicized as being these secure mechanisms for communications. And so um, we have these problematic laws. We also have these different um, mechanisms by which decisions need to be made online in Iran. So um, the law itself said that the filtering committee, which is a multi-agency body that consists um, partially of the elected administration of Rouhani as well as other entities, they are supposed to come convene and decide on what's filtered or not. However, we've seen uh, instances during the January protests that happened a few months ago um, where the Supreme Council for National Security decided what was going to go on arbitrarily outside of these processes that Iran itself has uh, put into place. So, there's these problematic elements that we see take place. Um, the Rouhani administration has to be commended for doing a lot in terms of um, achieving 
some things in terms of the promises they made when they um, campaigned. So we see achievements like the fact that there are um, hundreds of rural villages that were disconnected from the internet that are now have access. Um, for a period of time, there was a great um, increase in bandwidth or speeds inside of Iran. But there also have been a number of setbacks that come within the Rouhani administration itself. For example, uh, the National Internet Project, which have, has, is um, a project that has been going on for the past few years to localize a lot of the internet infrastructure within Iran. And in some ways, this has been really great in terms of making sure that Iran's banking infrastructure is secure from uh, foreign attacks. Um, however, we've seen this become really problematic and dangerous during uh, politically sensitive moments, like the January protests, where we saw the authorities again fearing mobilization and protests on the streets, and they started targeting um, internet access. But instead of shutting down the entire internet, this time they shut down uh, Iranians from accessing foreign traffic. So at the internet exchange points, we saw um, reports that um, every other international data package started being bumped off and this created widespread disruptions and users were saying they couldn't access foreign websites, but they could access local websites. So Khamenei.ir was accessible, but CNN.com, which is typically not filtered in Iran, was not accessible. Um, and so this meant that what the Rouhani government has been trying to initiate for the past few years with localizing all of this infrastructure suddenly became dangerous because the government felt empowered to do these shutdowns. We also see different um, policies in place like the, Iran's violations of net neutrality. So you have Rouhani's minister of ICT promoting uh, Iranian users to use local applications and local platforms instead of foreign ones. Don't use Telegram, use Surush, the local alternative. And in order to promote doing this, they've been providing subsidies, uh, which goes a long way in a country that's suffering economically and people, average people are having a hard time uh, making their monthly payments. And so this is a violation of net neutrality to provide these incentives to use these local alternatives. So while Rouhani comes out and makes these statements saying that he's against the filtering of Telegram, which him and his administration say has been in the hands of the judiciary um, and hardline elements within the government, which is true, he has been uh, quietly pushing these other policies that have been encouraging uh, this kind of activity inside of Iran. And so um, there's this uh, huge push now from the Rouhani administration and various others, um, even from the hardliners, to get Iranians to use Surush instead of Telegram after Telegram's blocking. And this is problematic for a number of different reasons. Firstly, in the fact that there's no data protection on these platforms. And um, initial security audits have shown that data and information of users can easily be retrieved. And there's obviously censorship going on in terms of what uh, users can achieve, uh, access on the various channels. And they've been implementing uh, policies that have kind of been forcing Iranians to go onto these platforms. Like if you're a university student and you want to follow what's going on in your department or in your courses, you have to get a Surish account and follow these things, which is very problematic for privacy and data protection. And so um, all of these things brings me uh, to the point that the Rouhani administration has been very eager to present themselves as leaders for in the ICT for development field. They often go to various forums and platforms and talk about a lot of these achievements, which are true and, and are quite tangible. But at the same time, um, they are undermining a lot of um, different values that exist within the UN mechanisms, within ITU mechanisms that call for open access. And um, through the EU, uh, this definitely should be pursued and uh, these policies should be put to task. Thank you both so much for setting, setting out uh, what you see as the developments, uh, some positive, but also a lot to be concerned about. And so let me start with a question, uh, if that's okay, because 
um, this this notion of how technology is used and how the internet is available and is not available reminds me a little bit of uh, the banning of satellite channels, but then when you walk around in, in Tehran or other cities and you look up, you see satellites on almost every roof. Uh, and then I understood from people that this, on the one hand, of course, reflects the practice of actually um, getting uh, signals through these satellites for television. But on the other hand, it ena enables the authorities to actually um, hold something against individuals at any moment, because uh, if they want, they can actually uh, point to the law and say the satellite on your roof uh, is illegal. So to what extent do you see a same or similar dynamic with the use of online tools? On the one hand, there's often talk about this halal internet, a very centralized, uh, systematically censored, systematically monitored um, internet environment, which some say cannot even be compared to the open internet at all uh, in Iran. And on the other hand, you do see the uptake of, of um, apps like Telegram. You, you see when you're in Iran, people using VPNs. Uh, you see the leaders of the Islamic Republic themselves taking to social media to communicate to the world, at least sometimes to platforms that are banned in Iran itself. So there's a lot of sort of layers, if not to say hypocrisy or double standards when it comes to the uh, internet. And so I'd be very interested to dig a deep, bit deeper into this question and also what you touched upon the uh, question of who actually has power and authority to restrict the use. I mean, we are very much, and you are in this report, looking to the government, the Rouhani administration, uh, for the reforms it promised, looking at whether this is credible, uh, whether those reforms are going to be um, delivered. On the other hand, we know that the judiciary has traditionally been much more hardline. There are many others with power. Uh, such as the Revolutionary Guards and others that are not accountable through elections, but that certainly have a lot of power, the religious authorities. So perhaps you can talk a little bit uh, in more detail about that dynamic so that people understand as well what we can realistically look to the government for, and in what sense there's also, uh, let's say, a confrontation being played out through questions of freedom of expression and press freedom, online freedoms, between these sort of power brokers uh, that are in government and of which, or uh, sorry, that are in power and of which the government is, let's say, one. Um, definitely there is a tension, it seems, between reformist elements, moderate elements, but to which the President Rouhani belongs to, and hardline elements. So one, I didn't touch upon this in my opening remarks, but one of the greatest achievements up until the January protests that the Rouhani administration um, held to its name was the fact that since 2015, the Rouhani government had been successful in preventing hardline elements from censoring Telegram and Instagram. And so Telegram became this popular central tool for communications in Iran in 2015, and it went to the filtering committee for the first time it was in January of 2015, I believe, and they were successfully able to block this, and it came to deliberations three or four times after this, and um, they were able to put a stop to this. They similarly were able to do this with Instagram, but then after the January protests, things um, catalyzed in a certain way that it, it seemed to go out of their hands. However, it seems that while these tensions do exist, the Rouhani government could be doing different, could be taking different routes to kind of contest this further if they wanted to make this their priority. However, um, it does seem like there are different um, political bargaining chips that the Rouhani government might be choosing to go for. Maybe um, right now they might be thinking uh, it's better to uh, start lobbying for more freedom of movement to work on nuclear negotiations as opposed to work on uh, living up to their promises on internet freedoms. So that might be going on as well. However, when Telegram was blocked on April 30th, for example, the Rouhani government had this ability to challenge the court orders uh, that came down from the judiciary through its own own attorneys through parliament, but it never took any of these routes. Uh, they decided just to put out superficial statements that said they were against it, but they actually took no actions to oppose it. So these kinds of tensions and um, public uh, elements of the administration's public diplomacy and actions also kind of coexist together.
Mm. Like to share the line a little bit about this, if we say there are 40 million Telegram users, why in Iran? Uh, Telegram only started in 2014. Um, it picked up there quickly for several reasons. One of them is that other telecommunication uh, tools were also uh, shut down by Iranian authority. Viper, WhatsApp, uh, other similar tools have been, Twitter, have been shut down as well. It's one of those uh, tools that brings Twitter and WhatsApp together. Like if you're talking about the functions, you have a communication system and also a public channel where you can exchange views. And this is why uh, some of those people who manage the Telegram channels are considered journalists for us at CPJ. We defend them if they get into trouble because they have thousands and thousands of users who rely on them for election coverage, for example. It was one of the areas of contention when uh, Rouhani used this platform a lot for mobilization of support for sharing news about the election process. And ahead of his own first election and second election, many of the people who are using Telegram for mobilization and for sharing of news were arrested by the Committee to Determine Innocent of Criminal Content. It's one of the people, one of the institutions that at the heart of this battle, it's a 12-member um, committee that includes six members of the Rouhani administration, ministers, officials, and six members which can be on the opposite side. And that's how close the power struggle is, that this committee can, and legally, can discuss and remove a lot of restrictions if they want to, and not just Telegram, Twitter, Instagram, which is under Facebook, also a lot, uh, a big market for business, for sharing information, for journalists to uh, communicate. Those are the heart of the battle, and I think the way the Rouhani administration is treated is dependent a lot about how the Iranian people continue to use it. Last time Viper and others were uh, shut down, uh, millions joined Telegram, and the numbers of those apps have shut down. This time, that's not happening. People are still using Telegram, and they are trying to find ways to um, access it under VPN and other ways. And there are lawyers who are challenging the judiciary itself in law right now in uh, the legality of imposing the ban. So these are all channels. I think the Iranian people who use Telegram to mobilize and to go and vote in millions uh, in 2013, 2016, and 17 in various elections on the side of reform, on the side of openness, are the ones who are going to decide which of those six member parties in that uh, committee uh, is going to win. Thank you. Um, with that, let me open it up for questions from you all here and potentially from, uh, from the online sphere. I'll look to you to just inform me if you see any questions popping up online. Uh, but first, uh, in the room, it would be great if you can introduce yourself before you ask a question and then uh, we'll see who's best suited to answer. Who would like to start? Yes. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Sarah Bouchetub. Uh, I am a campaigner and uh, program manager at the International Federation of Journalists for the Middle East region. Um, I, I, first, I want to thank you for, for this meeting and for the report. I think it's an excellent report and uh, concise enough and goes straight to the point. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it's timely. I mean, it probably has been in the, in the pipeline for a while, and, you know, events are changing quickly uh, politically for Iran. So is it timely or not? It's, it's a different issue. But I just want to uh, point out a couple uh, issues. Um, the first one is, of course, the main issue in the main topic of the report, or as it's titled, is press freedom. And I think it's important, as you do, 
uh, to recognize that there has been uh, improvements in terms of access to information, in terms of internet freedoms in Iran, and in, in a dialogue or in a, a wider political discussions with Iranian or uh, outside, I think it's important to be genuine and to recognize those um, progresses. Uh, otherwise, you look like you know, you are only focusing on the negatives, and I think there has been uh, great changes under the Rouhani administrations since uh, he arrived uh, on power. I think this is very, very important to, to recognize. Uh, the other point is that, uh, again, to be genuine and to, 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 to have a proper debate with uh, Iranian stakeholders, with Iranian authorities. I think it's important to, uh, to look at um, you know, the, the, the Iranian society, collective actions, uh, national networks. Your report refers to the journalist associations, uh, its struggles, the fact that it hasn't been reopened as a national independent organization in Iran. There, has been, uh, there have been a lot of reports also about uh, issues facing trade unionists in Iran, uh, freedom of, of, of associations, freedom of uh, trade unions. This is a, a very, very big uh, problem, uh, not only because of the social impacts this has on people, on workers in Iran, including in the media, in the media sector, but also the impact it has on society as a whole and its inability to, to organize and have platforms, uh, networks of, of discussions, and a proper uh, so, uh, civil society organizations. I think this is maybe one point that could have been, um, you know, that we can maybe discuss a bit further and uh, include in any uh, uh, discussions with Iranian authorities. Uh, everything looks... Uh, from the outside, uh, you know, or may look politically oriented. Uh, we, uh, at the International Federation of Journalists, defend also, uh, uh, you know, uh, journalists, uh, bloggers, uh, freedom uh, campaigners, activists. But it's important to to keep in mind that things might look politically oriented, and therefore it's important also to to refer to. Uh, to, to, to local uh, networks and, and organizations and defend the, their ability to operate rather than uh, single out uh, individuals and uh, you know, turn them into uh, symbols of, of this fight. There, there is a bigger uh, challenge in Iranian society and I think that, uh, that's important to focus. And perhaps just a, a last point, it's, uh, I think we, uh, it's important to keep Rouhani uh, uh, accountable for his promises, the promises he made when he arrived and on which he built his political campaigns. But as you, uh, your report shows um, in a very, very good way, the dynamics, the power uh, structure in Iran is, is very complex. And, um, and you know, those powers, including the supreme leaders and, you know, the different institutions that exist in Iran should also be called on for change. Uh, it's uh, Rouhani is, is the president. He is, you know, uh, he has to abide by his program, but there is more than him. He's not the only face of Iran, and it's important to reach out uh, to other uh, institutions, to other uh, uh, groups in the country. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and uh, also questions. I think maybe it would be good to spend a little bit of time in your answering on why the timing for this report now, because I'm sure there's people who have ideas about it and maybe we should just uh, be clear about it. I mean, personally, I think for years there have been arguments why not to focus on human rights now because, you know, the deal and other issues and some people have also suggested that criticizing the Rouhani government as the sort of least aggressive force in Iran could play into the hands of the hardliners. I personally think actually in the EU we have lost time by, or we've seen the loss of time because leaders buy into that argument. Because certainly government leaders and external action service has really prioritized talks on the nuclear program. And it's actually been going on much longer than we had hoped. And then it's now back on the agenda. And I think uh, in a mature dialogue with any country, 
we can address multiple topics at the same time. We do this all the time with many countries, so I don't see why uh, when it comes to Iran there's only room for one topic. That's my personal opinion, um, but we can, we can go into that more. But I think what you touched upon, the broader context of civil society, trade unions, um, all the rights issues that are embedded in those very topics are very important. And um, it's important to note progress, but it's also fair to say that the lack of respect in the Islamic Republic is still so fundamental that we have to really keep pushing, I believe, with all power brokers. And that's what we do when we travel to Iran. It's not always easy. We cannot talk to everyone necessarily, but uh, we try, uh, for sure, as members of European Parliament to do that. And that might also be good to touch upon proactively, uh, especially as a female parliamentarian. There's often a lot of criticism when we travel to Iran because I am also then forced to wear a religious symbol, the headscarf. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, when we go, we also get a lot of pushback, especially as women, because when men travel, we never hear that criticism. So any thoughts uh, from, from uh, you on the effect of direct dialogue, uh, direct addressing of the very criticism that's in your report would also be valuable to inform uh, mm -hmm. our decisions going forward, whether or not to travel and what the impact might be, what the best um, ways might be, for me would be very informative. But thank you for the question and the comments. And I'll look around while you answer for uh, next people who would like to ask questions. Sure, so why now? And I think the title of our report says it on the table, any table, any table of negotiation with the Iranian government on any issue, including security and strategy and a vision for the future should include press freedom. Why? Why now? I think it's important when everyone is discussing the commitments of Iran as a responsible government to its own people and to the international community is to find ways to build trust. And you can only build trust if you're standing by your word. And this is one, why it's important to specifically look at Rouhani, where he stood by his word, where he tried, and where he actually went against the words he said publicly. Specifically on press freedom, because this is the time where everyone is going to debate and discuss approach where the EU, European governments, are uh, taking a route outside of US uh, in terms of Iran. And to have a vision about this is to include multiple factors. You don't have a strategy without weighing in the priorities, the threats, going through the scenarios. And we don't, you don't have an engagement strategy without have without knowing the audience, without knowing the people that you're trying to talk to. And that audience and those people rely on communication. And if you want to connect and build bridges, not walls, then you should allow engagement of people, representative people, civil society, uh, online populations, exiled populations. Those people are probably the ones who are going to be under threat the most if you want to engage and discuss a future in which people are talking about peace, democracy, rule of law as elements. This is what um, um, uh, Mogherini have said in response to the US withdrawal from the Iran deal, is that the EU is looking for a, a, a future in which they will be a force for those principles, those are the principles that the EU was founded for seeking peace and solutions that expands the pie, that brings people and connects them. And I don't see why anyone would doubt discussing the internet users, 80 million out of 100 million uh, market that's opening up for Europe, for European countries, how could not we engage and know about what's changing in that market and what the most vulnerable population and the most useful allies. And those are civil society voices, 
these are people uh, expressing themselves without fear of uh, reprisal and without censorship. This is a discussion that should be happening and should be central to any vision the EU is uh, discussing if it wants to be comprehensive and proactive, not just responding to what the US does and not just responding to the tweets of the day. Something? Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that when Rouhani was elected in 2013, I think it was a lot of human rights activists and advocates were really looking forward to his administration, namely because of the fact that they knew the individuals he was going to place within the UN, within uh, EU to represent his administration were going to be more open to dialogue and human rights. So. It is true that conditions are oftentimes for a lot of different uh, issues related to freedom of expression, press freedoms, internet rights. It, they are much better than previous administrations, but um, he also is providing an opportunity to engage, which is why it's great to be here to be talking about how to do this. The second point I want to make is with the close of, um, with Trump's withdrawal from the Iran deal, uh, this coincided with what seems to be massive social media campaigns that seem to be aligned with um, this narrative that Iran, um, that oftentimes Iranians want the withdrawal from the Iran deal, Iranians uh, welcome sanctions. And there, there are initial studies being done that's kind of showing how this narrative of human rights, of activism is being co-opted by um, those pursuing the end of the Iran deal by elements within um, the Republican administrations within, within the United States that are trying to take over this narrative of human rights and pursue it for their own agenda. So it's more important than ever to be, to be asking Iran to get involved, to try to um, you know, help maintain a truthful narrative on this issue and not allow it to be co-opted by these agendas that might be around for you know, their own nefarious reasons or their own political um, leanings. Thank you. Next question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Diegel. I work for Green MEP Klaus Buchner, uh, who's also a member of the Iran delegation. And uh, first of all, thank you, Ms. Hake, and the speakers for this important event. I think it's, it's about time we, we speak about this. Um, I have two questions. When we saw in the report that there's 80 million smartphone users, I assume that uh, cyber surveillance technology now is more important than ever for the regime. And my question is, I'm not sure if you can answer it, where, where are they getting it from? And the second question, how, how available is effective encryption for the average Iranian? And what are the roadblocks for them to actually get this? Thank you. I think we have enough time to to do each question, so there's time for details. But I'll I'll see you and come back to you. Um, do you want to start with that? Sure. Was your question where are they getting their smartphones from? No, the cyber surveillance technology. Yeah. The cyber surveillance. That? And then how uh, how available is encryption for the average Iranian? So regarding cyber surveillance technology, I think Mariche might be able to speak better to that since you work on export controls. So I'll leave that to her. Um, regarding uh, the difficulties in encryption, um, so I think I alluded to the fact that within the computer crimes law, Article 10 says encryption is illegal. However, this is really hard to implement because basically um, the majority of the technology we're using these days is encrypted. So if you have an iPhone, you're breaking the law in Iran because your iPhone is encrypted. So um, this is, it's really easy to have encrypted technology because it's becoming pretty much ubiquitous. Um, WhatsApp isn't blocked. WhatsApp is end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why WhatsApp may not be blocked in Iran is because it doesn't have a significant enough user base to be targeted. Signal, on the other hand, um, it's marketed as this secure platform. It has funding from the Open Technology Foundation, which is associated with the United States. So it's, I think for that reason, it's been targeted. So um, I don't think it's particularly difficult. I know in 2015 um, there was a particular effort that actually came from the Rouhani administration where they were targeting um, the SSL certificates of um, websites and if they weren't getting their certificates from 
uh, local hosts, they started blocking it. And so there's this famous case of one blogger inside of Iran. Um, I, I won't name his name uh, here, but uh, he, he's quite vocal about internet freedom. However, he, he's, uh, he's a technologist and he, f he freely operates in Iran. And he moved his certificate um, over to cloud Cloudflare, and so he's now blocked in Iran. He operates his website from Iran, but since he uses Cloudflare, they started targeting um, those SSL certificates. And so um, there is this kind of uh, attention and um, yeah, sensitivity towards things that are uh, publicizing themselves as being foreign encrypted tools. Thank you, it's also my observation, but this is very anecdotal, that a lot of Iranians have a lot of tech knowledge, also on the security part, simply because they have to. Um, because we learned so much ever since 2009 how um, not only people were using their devices and platforms to organize, but also how Western companies were providing the very systems that were in turn used to crack down on people and to locate them and to drag them out of their homes into uh, prison cells uh, and uh, the like. So while we may not know exactly who is providing the surveillance systems, uh, I think it is important that we, and I know that um, uh, Mr. Buchner has also been uh, one of the leading voices in this and it's been really good to cooperate, uh, that we think it's very important to at least stop European-made surveillance systems that are commercially available without much restriction these days that are becoming faster, cheaper, and smaller every day. That you know, it's it's absurd uh, to me and to a lot of my colleagues that these systems can still be freely bought by whoever uh, has the the euros to buy buy them. So, uh, Iran has been an example also for monitoring systems. For example, you may recall the discussions on uh, the monitoring over the telecoms networks after 2009, and we in this parliament made a lot of noise to stop that at the time, and successfully uh, so. But it's still not a systematic solution. And so what we're looking at here in the parliament, and we've actually adopted a resolution with majority support, is to have more screening on surveillance technologies before they get exported and also screen for human rights impact. And these would be two new additions to existing export controls, uh, adding the surveillance systems clearly defined, uh, specifically targeting this dangerous, harmful, uh, kind of technology, not not a broad uh, sweep uh, regulation, but really very targeted to these specific technologies, and then uh, looking at the human rights impact to make sure that the EU takes its responsibility. And we can really use uh, support from civil society because uh, there's not much movement in the council on this. Um, they see a lot of uh, reasons why not to prioritize it, but I think for anyone who cares about cybersecurity, who wants to avoid corporate espionage, uh, and who cares about human rights, this is all very, very important. So I hope uh, this is on your radar as well. Uh, with that, uh, I'll ask the next question. Thank you. Um, sure. My name is Omri Price, and I, I work here at Frontline Defenders. We're a human rights NGO that works with the human rights defenders at risk. And uh, I have one general question and one specific one, uh, just following on what we've just said. I just want to press you a little bit more on um, uh, what to do with this school of thought that says, you know, um, we'll talk about human rights later, for whatever reason. Um, and in the current political uh, climate with, the, with what's going on, what's your assessment of um, how the pol a political scene in Iran would respond to, to external pressure on human rights, and specifically, what should Europe or European actors do to actually have an impact on human rights in Iran positively? Because you know the situation is in is such is in such flux that it's difficult for external observers to really see. And uh, you mentioned that you said quite a lot about how Telegram is being uh, controlled or censored uh, within Iran. You've mentioned that Signal is also being controlled, but can you say a little bit more about how? And also, if you know of any more advanced attempts at, at hacking or breaking encryption or anything like that, that's come to your attention. Thanks. I can talk a little bit about the internal dynamics. And I think the internal dynamics is going to be changing every day. And there are people laughing right now at both sides of 
uh, any table uh, that discusses Iran. And I think the conservatives are probably uh, having a, an I told you so moment about the lack of commitment from the U.S. Um, president on delivery on the deal. My uh, assessment and uh, review of the situation is that this will continue to happen. There will be people inside Iran, outside Iran, in Europe, in the U.S., in Israel, in Saudi, who do not want to see diplomacy work and who wants to see a failure in reaching a peaceful resolution. And we have suffered uh, in the Middle East from similar confrontation over the last five years, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, you can name how the military conflicts in the region have uh, uh, resulted in a trail of casualties in terms of media personnel, in terms of uh, censorship rise and other. And what I'm hoping is that uh, at least we don't have a war in which we all have to deal with those consequences yet again in the Middle East. But what I'm saying is it's also an opportunity to reach for allies and to build those civilian connections and to f find out solutions. And a dialogue that the Rouhani administration have said they are committed to since 2014. When we first heard of it, our approach was, yes, we want a dialogue. We asked for meetings with the Iranian uh, representative to the UN. We met with them. We asked for more visas for journalists. We asked for even Iranian journalists who come to the UN to give permission to cover the US, which is the restriction that exists. We want all parties to be able to have access and to be able to talk and to give journalists access to what's happening in the negotiations on the nuclear deal. That didn't used to be the case in 2015. Why shouldn't it be the case right now, where people are talking about intentions? And instead of talking about intentions, let Iranian officials, European officials, American officials open themselves up to the media, open themselves up to the people about what they are saying, what they are doing, and what decision making is taking place. And that, it, I think, the only guarantee to get into a better solution other than a confrontation. Um, I think you were asking about how Signal is being censored, and so um, Signal has been censored on and off since, um, can't tell you exactly when, but it was reported since 2016. Um, at the moment, I know that it's a bit decentralized how it's being uh, targeted, uh, just because different ISP providers can implement censorship uh, on their own. And um, I have heard reports that some people using like Iran Cell have been finding accessibility, but if they're using Hamrai Aval, another ISP provider, um, they can't access it. So it's a bit hit and miss like that. One of the issues, though, that was raised by a lot of different um, uh, folks working on digital rights in Iran, especially during the protests, was the fact that Telegram was being filtered um, and people didn't have a secure way to communicate. I mean, WhatsApp is secure, but it doesn't necessarily have all of the features that an activist who's worried about um, physical seizure of their devices would have, because Signal has things like ephemeral messaging or disappearing messages that's really useful when you're doing any type of um, risky communications. And so it was blocked, and then Signal has this function where, um, I mean, it used to have this function where it would do domain fronting, where it would go through um, the Google search servers, which wouldn't be blocked in a country implementing censorship just because Google oftentimes is so central to the internet, so governments don't target it. And so uh, domain fronting wasn't um, enabled on the Signal platform in Iran just because Google App Engine was sanctioned because Google was complying in a certain way with um, uh, the US uh, sanction policies. And so the circumvention wasn't available inside of Iran, but it was available in Egypt, which sometimes also does uh, a censor um, signal. And so uh, this was a problematic element that was so you're seeing internet controls being put on Iranian users from an American company in that instance, just to go off on a little 
tangent about Signal. Um, I think you were asking about cyber attacks as well. What's interesting is that a lot of um, Iranians inside of Iran that you wouldn't su suspect have been experiencing uh, attacks. So you had something like the Imam Ali charity in April, which you wouldn't really, I guess they're kind of more uh, on the reformist, moderate side. They were targeted by, it seemed, government um, attackers uh, through their Telegram accounts and various social media feeds. Um, since April, there has been an increase of targeting of phishing attacks against various journalists and activists, both inside of Iran and outside. I think one of the most famous cases in the past year was the hacking into the emails of President, the Vice President um, uh, Eptekar, which is uh, pretty uh, funny. But it, there's no direct link to Iranian authorities, but it's generally thought that it's linked to some sort of intelligence or revolutionary guards these attacks, and they subsist mainly in phishing attacks and notably uh, telegram hacks, which occur through SMS verification logins. Mm. Thank you. It also struck me in your report that there's also uh, journalists that have been um, targeted from the state media, like uh, ISNA, uh, if I read it correctly. So it seems like it, there's no um, defense in that sense if you work for the state-run media against these kinds of attacks. So that was interesting for me to see as well. Um, any other questions? Yes, let me just also look this way. Go ahead, yeah. I'll try to be short. No, I, I just, it's just a small remark. I think that th there is a lot of interest, and uh, rightly so, in uh, technologies, cybersecurity, individual liberties, and all this is extremely important. Uh, but also, this debate is about press freedom. And no matter how free uh, people can express themselves on social media, this is, isn't a replacement to a proper uh, independent journalism in Iran. And this is at the moment, the biggest problem, because there have been improvement and um, people are protecting themselves, there are VPNs, etc. But the biggest challenge at the moment, and journalism plays a, a key role in democratic change, is independent journalism. And there isn't any. There aren't any, uh, there, is, there aren't any freedoms for people to organize, for journalists to organize. There is now, um, since the end of last year, a new uh, journalist association which has been established uh, mm -hmm. to represent uh, journalists working in Iran, in uh, Tehran. I think it gathers some 16,000, uh, I mean, there are some 16,000 journalists working in the capital, but this is the organization that aims to represent them. It's not a national one. It's, uh, it managed to establish itself uh, through uh, genuine elections uh, with the uh, authori authorization of the authorities, and it's starting to function. So this is a, a good sign. But we are very, very far from a situation where we have, uh, you know, a, a body of uh, a journalism corps, journalism working properly, independent media outlets. And, and I think it's, it's a shame that all the debate has shifted uh, and, and focused almost exclusively on social media. Social media isn't a replacement for journalism. It's important to have freedom of expression, but let's not forget about uh, journalists who are, at the end, the only uh, people who can bring um, or put genuine debate, uh, investigate, uh, you know, social issues, political issues, and communicate them publicly because, you know, it's not just about communicating and hiding <laughs> through technology to communicate secretly in a country. Those issues have to be put in the open to the Iranian public and they have to be heard. And this is, I think, what the European Union should do and include in its demand and uh, negotiation with the Iranians. <coughs> I couldn't agree with you more. Um, of course, it's not a replacement or shouldn't be a replacement. I think what it does signal is that there's a real appetite for more pluralist debate that uh, even with severe legal restrictions and you know space for this pluralist free uh, journalism environment to, uh, to flourish, that people are ready for it. And I do think that that is important, that um, 
we see in Iranian society that despite the world's heaviest restrictions and repressions and heaviest consequences when breaching uh, very restrictive laws, that people still uh, are you know, engaging in these kinds of debates. I think the other element is that it's clearly uh, double standard by the rulers to themselves take to social media to communicate with the world or with people while these very platforms are actually restricted in Iran. So I think that that's why you'll see that some people point this out. Uh, but certainly, um, it should never be um, to overshadow the need for actual press freedom to be respected, as it should not be um, distracting from the whole spectrum of human rights and fundamental freedoms in Iran, which I think has been overshadowed. I think there has been a real uh, problem to keep European leadership focused on human rights and the, the position of the population in the broadest sense because of the nuclear deal and because of uh, now the US withdrawal from that nuclear deal. Because basically we're talking about the deal again only and there are certainly those who think it would be bad timing to talk about human rights. But uh, I think there's never a bad timing to talk about human rights and it's really our responsibility to keep focusing uh, on it. And again, and I said it before, but I really think it's important. Um, to me, it makes no sense to reduce the relationship with a country like Iran to one topic, which is the nuclear program. I mean, the the um, interest from Iran is is certainly to talk about economic ties, to talk about the environment, to talk about countering terrorism and security, to talk about drug trafficking. You know, there's a lot of things that, that the Iranian side puts on the agenda. I really don't see why uh, we shouldn't see more proactive um, agenda setting from the European side, and I would say human rights should be the priority and Iran's toxic role in the region, because clearly uh, the support for the Assad regime, uh, its role in Iraq, Lebanon, Yemen, also is of deep concern here in Europe, and there is no reason why we should shy away from mentioning that. Uh, I'm on the record saying that many times, so I'm happy to repeat it, but I think it's even more important that we reach government leaders and uh, the high representative, the Iran task force, and others in this town who are very focused on Iran to broaden their agenda and not to get bogged down by just one topic. Um, let me see if there's any other questions or if you wanted to reply to the comment that was made. Um, any no, of you I have anything to it's add? It's one of the top recommendations that we make here and the analysis about the establishment of the media guild in Iran. And it is uh, one of the important protections that journalists can get on the ground um, that is one of the disappointing things that Rouhani administration could not have proposed a better uh, solution to replace it. The attempt he made with his administration was replacing it with a government body that is um, hired than selected by various government agencies, which in some sense basically uh, makes it uh, under the security apparatus, which is nothing from what people wanted from having this association. And I think this is the heart of the issue of dialogue. If his administration wants dialogue, if his administration wants uh, to support reform, representatives of each of the populations in Iranian uh, constituencies, including the media, should be given the chance to act uh, without fear and without censorship, and also without fear of reprisal for what they do. And the front lines are always local journalists defending their peers. Whatever we and others do is only secondary to what the people on the ground can do in order to improve the situation. And we have used the uh, association in the past in our reporting about the worst uh, condition of uh, dozens of journalists being imprisoned. And I think their role is essential in any discussion of a civilian uh, dialogue inside and outside Iran. Thank you so much. Um, with that, I think, uh, looking around, we've uh, addressed some very important questions. Uh, thank you, too, for uh, addressing 
your work and the uh, pile of work that still remains to be done without uh, forgetting about the successes that are also recognized, and I think that's, that's essential. Um, I hope this gives food for addressing press freedom with European leaders to not be forgotten amidst new talks about the JCPOA. Uh, I do believe there is broad support for keeping Europe's side of the um, commitment alive and binding Iran to verifiable restrictions in its nuclear program. But unfortunately, the United States has stepped away, which is why that is now dominating agendas again. Um, again, thank you very, very much, uh, Committee to Protect Journalists, and uh, both of you and everyone who was here and everyone who watched online. Thanks a lot. Thank you.